I got a comment once that said that at the beginning of all these episodes, I tend to make every artist I cover sound like the Beatles of their era. We will not be doing that today, even though we are covering an actual Beatle. Hello, children. You know who I am. I know who you are. That's right. The man, Ringo Starr. And believe me, I could easily make a big deal out of Ringo if I wanted. Like, people forget this, but even separate from the Beatles, Ringo was genuinely hot shit as a pop star. Way more successful than... than really makes any sense. I'm the greatest, baby, you better believe it! Two top ten albums, eight top ten singles, two of them number ones. People just loved Ringo. In fact, if you cherry-pick your stats a little, you can make the case that right after the breakup, the most successful Beatle was Ringo, at least for a little while. When Ringo had his first hit, all the other Beatles had singles out too, and the highest charting one of them all was Ringo's. But I feel like hyping up Ringo's importance and fame would do a disservice to why people liked him at all. An idiot is all out of key and nervous. His whole deal was not being a figure of towering importance. Let's look at the knocks against him. He was the worst singer in the Beatles, the worst songwriter, the worst looking, and most importantly, the one who didn't seem like he was ever trying very hard to do much of anything. He wasn't a fiercely driven creative dynamo like Paul, or a spiritualist like George, or an activist like John. And that was his charm. People liked him because he was the underdog, the schlub among geniuses, the regular guy. And how was he able to turn that into a solo career? Well, the glib answer is that he got by with a little help from his friends, which is something that everyone who writes about Ringo is obligated to say at least once. But it's true. And you know what? Having friends is a skill. For some artists, it's their only skill. All the other Beatles and tons of rock stars lined up to work with Ringo, write him songs, back him up, make him successful. And that couldn't have happened if Ringo hadn't just been this profoundly likable guy who knew he'd won the lottery and just wanted to share his good fortune with everyone. It's not because I did not he was such a bad fit for pop stardom, and that's exactly what made him a star. Ringo was just good vibes. But after a good solid run of hits, the cheery atmosphere of Ringo Mania started to run out. His third album was a commercial disappointment, with only one semi-hit that fell short of the top 20. The times were changing, and Ringo's good fortune in life had started to seem less delightful and more grating and undeserved. But Ringo was not ready to give up the limelight. So the decision was made. Clearly the whole, with a little help from my friend shtick was getting old. So instead, why don't we try and get by with no help from our friends? No John, Paul, or George. No Eric Clapton. No Elton John. Just songs performed and mostly written by goddamn Ringo Starr. Oh, and it's 1977. Music is changing. We've got to keep up with the times. So here we go. The singer's gonna sing a song, and he wants you all to sing along. So let me introduce to you the one and only Disco Ringo! Oh my my. No, 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 no. Disco sucks. Or at least it sucks when Ringo does it. Ringo tried to get on the dance floor and found out it don't come easy, because a king of boogie he was not. You know I'm oh god. I got blisters on me fingers and blood coming out of my ears. Ringo sings out of tune and everyone stands up and walks out on him for good. This is Train Records. <laughs> The problem with Ringo the Fourth comes right with the title. It's called that because it's his fourth album. Allegedly. But that's actually not true. Right when the Beatles broke up, Ringo released a couple quickie records that no one talks about. So technically this is actually his sixth album. Oops. According to Wikipedia, it could also be a reference to him being the fourth Beatle. <laughs> Last and least. This track here is made out to the Beatles. You divide it any way you want. If you want to give Ringo less, that's up to you. Ringo occupies a very strange place in rock history. Kind of a legend and kind of a joke. The two sides actually play off each other. He wouldn't be such a joke if he wasn't such a big part of the Beatles legend. And since he's such a legend, it's okay to make jokes. 
I mean, Ringo plays into it himself. He's never had a problem with being the worst of the best. He's never looked jealous or resentful. He'll tell you straight up that just because he's successful doesn't mean he succeeded. It just kind of happened to him. And so to that end, he's kept up a large amount of goodwill by just being aware of his limitations and not trying to reach beyond his grasp. He's never wanted more. But hold on. Is that actually true? I only want it to be number one. There's number nowhere else to go. Number three is no good. No, number three is, is okay, but it's not number one. I want number one because that's the game. I'm not going out there to be 49th. Ringo might be the least creative Beatle by far, but he's not a man completely devoid of creativity. He had some help, yes, but he did co-write several of his best-known songs. And when we got to 1977, he released a whole album where the majority of the songs were written by him. How did that happen? Okay, in 1975, Ringo leaves Apple Records. After a fierce label bidding war for Ringo, he signs with Atlantic Records in a seventh album deal. Now, the approach to the third album was the same as the other ones. Big, upbeat, goofy songs with a lot of guest stars. It was called Ringo's Rotogravure. Uh, okay, a rotogravure is... You know what, don't worry about it. The record flops because no one knows what that is. And also, probably, people were just tired of Ringo. The 60s are over, no one's buying records just to get a whiff of Beatlemania anymore. People have figured out that the Beatles weren't getting back together and that this wasn't the next best thing. And it's not like the other guys were giving Ringo their A material anymore anyway. Like, here's the last song Ringo got from John. Well, I'm a cookie. so that's not working anymore. Maybe it's time for the next step. Maybe Ringo needed to prove himself to the public on his own and finally separate himself from the other Beatles. Ringo can go platinum with no features? Sure. And so he and his co-writing partner, Vinnie Poncia, got together and wrote a whole new batch of songs. In August of 77, he released the first one called Wings. Y you know that's the name of Paul's band, right? So much for escaping his shadow. It's, it's like he's trying to subliminally get you to think Paul and Linda are on this. Anyway, Wings is a more rock, almost kind of blues track of all things. Well, let's hear the Ringo blues. If I had the wings of an eagle Over these broken dreams I would fly If I could be shot like an arrow Straight to you This really isn't anything, is it? I mean, I guess it's not the worst thing ever. But, like, the groove just isn't there. It's lumpy and awkward, and Ringo's flat warble doesn't help. Yeah, I don't get it. Ringo doesn't have the muscle for this kind of track. It has no hook. It doesn't land. Why was this the single? Oh, I need you. And also, this song is just kind of dour. Like, say what you want about classic Ringo, he was fun. That's what people liked him for. Putting him on like this gritty blues song is like listening to Pitbull trying to do a trap song. Weirdly enough though, Ringo seems to be surprisingly fond of this one, considering that he resurrected it 35 years later and redid it, but with like, reggae guitar on it. Yeah, a reggae groove must be what it was missing in 1977 because this did nothing. Completely flopped, didn't chart. I'm sure he had to be disappointed. But hey, this kind of sound is not really up to date anyway. It's 77, baby. It's time to get in touch with what the people are listening to. It's the late 70s and disco fever has overtaken the world. Within the next year or so, disco will be so big that it will crowd out basically every other form of music. Everyone will pivot to disco. Disco is going up, 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 baby. At this point in the story, Saturday Night Fever is still months away, so Ringo's actually very early on the bandwagon, at least among rock stars who shouldn't be making disco. So why don't we see Ringo try and get his boogie on? Okay, 
Rito the Fourth has six Ringo originals and four covers. This is one of the covers. I've been down one time. It's an early Philly soul hit called Drowning in the Sea of Love. Originally by Joe Simon, reached number 11 on the Hot 100 in 1972. Okay, it's, um, it's, it's based around like the idea he's going down one time, two times, and then he's drowning because there was a myth that someone had to go under three times before you knew they were drowning or something like that. You'd, you'd see it in old cartoons. I, I don't know, it's old. That might be why it hasn't gone down as like a beloved soul standard or anything. But you know, a lot changes in five years. Maybe that smooth, gamble and huff groove needed a big disco makeover for Ringo to be the one singing it. Drowning in something, all right. Strings and backup singers, mostly. Okay, so about disco. Okay, we all know how a few years after this, there'll be a big disco backlash of terrifying ferocity. And obviously it was laden with heavy overtones of racism and homophobia. We all know that. That's all true. But can I say here, there is a legitimate case against disco. It's easy to defend disco when time has winnowed it down to a couple dozen stone classics, but most disco songs were not as tight as Stayin' Alive or Love to Love You Baby. And we talk up disco's connection to outsider demographics, but please understand, disco was repulsively mainstream, and a whole lot of it was made for and by lame white people. A whole ton of disco songs had no personality and they were horrifically overproduced. In other words, it sounded like this. It's all way too much, and Ringo has to really strain to make himself heard over this, and that's really not a thing you want Ringo to do. You know I'm drowning. Drowning. I am really fascinated by this video, by the way. We have slammed the door on fun Uncle Ringo, and instead we got him here as some kind of like depressed playboy, dressed to the nines, surrounded by glamour and women but looking miserable, drinking expensive scotch with a sad expression, walking into the ocean. Ringo is like the Drake of 1977, apparently. Yeah, believe it or not, I don't think Ringo as the portrait of moody, dissipated opulence is the image people really wanted from him. I like how the song ends with like two straight minutes of no Ringo in it. Shockingly, this tanked too. Okay, well, those were the first two singles. Let's travel down the album. Track one was Drowning. Track two is called Tango All Night. Here we go. Who's dancing on the table? Look away. I wanna tango all night. Mambo till daylight. That was all she said. Um, you know, I don't actually have any, like, live footage of this song, obviously, so, uh... I'm just gonna throw up a background I think fits. We wanna tango all night. Ay, 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 ay. I mean, you, you get it, right? There's like a Muppety atmosphere to this. This is one of the cover songs. The original's pretty obscure and probably no one had heard it, but you can still tell this is like the variety show rendition of a real song. Like, our special guest is Ringo Starr and he's gonna do a dance number in between some skits. At, if it was the Muppets, that would at least make sense how annoying the background vocals are. By the way, even though his famous bandmates are not on here, there are, in fact, a couple notable names. We got background vocals from mid-tier pop star Melissa Manchester, the not-yet-famous Luther Vandross, uh, the famous but not-yet-legendary Bette Midler, Bette Midler is on one song, and it is, of course, this one. God, biggest waste of Bette Midler since the Stepford Wives remake. The fourth track is Gave It All Up. It's about a guy who gives up a life of crime, and then a life of booze for love. I gave it all up. I gave it all up. I gave it all up for love. Out of all the songs on here, this is the one I would like to hear from a person who could sing. Because 
It otherwise sounds very pretty. But again, Ringo is just not up for it. Gave it all up for you. Who let Ringo do this? Okay, the producer for this is Arif Marden. Super underrated guy, hits for decades. He helped many a white person get their R&B on. He's the one who got the Bee Gees to switch to dance music. The man made I Feel For You for Chaka Khan, so like he's legit. He had produced Ringo's last album too, but uh, you know, there he's mostly just following the Ringo playbook. On this record, he had a chance to flex. And, like, I don't know, he's bringing his A-game. Like, the tragedy of this record is that many of the songs sound very good. Except for Ringo. I swear to God, you can hear the producer turning down the volume on Ringo's mic. Rolling Stone's review pointed out that producing for Ringo is a real challenge. You have to be light enough to capture his charm, but heavy enough to cover for his singing. Martin doesn't seem to be trying to thread that needle at all. The music and the artist are completely at odds. A lot of reviewers think that he probably didn't care about Ringo or his music, this was just a paycheck for him. Yeah, well, it sure sounds like it. Okay, here's one of the covers. Sneakin' Sally Through the Alley, already recorded by Robert Palmer earlier in the 70s. Not a hit at the time, but pretty well respected now. No thanks to Ringo. And Ringo. I'm sorry, I don't think there's a single song that could be recorded by King of Suave Robert Palmer and Ringo Goddamn Star. Might as well face it, you're addicted to love. Yeah, I'm harping on his singing, I know. He's always sounded like that and never bothered anyone before. Okay, but he was singing Yellow Submarine, not Tomorrow Never Knows, and that was for a reason. Everyone was smart enough to put Ringo on simple and friendly songs. Ringo was successful during what I call the lame 70s. It's the name I give to the very kitschy, corny style of AM pop that was big at the time. It lasted through the entire 70s, but midway through it starts getting crowded out by disco as the main sound of pop. And even though disco could also be very lame, it was always dramatically hipper and sexier than this other stuff. I did an episode on The Carpenters during this time frame, and while I was doing that, I had to watch Karen Carpenter try to sing Boogie Nights and do the hustle and ugh, really showed me how unequipped she was for that half of the decade. Ringo gives me the exact same feeling but worse. Like, disco is flashy and glamorous. Ringo is the guy who sings Octopus's Garden. And like, here's a song called Can She Do It Like She Dances. The boys had just one question on their minds. Can she do it? These songs are on like the cornier, goofier end of disco, so you'd think Ringo could handle it, but it still hits completely wrong. Like, Sneakin' Sally Through the Alley is a cheating song. And does she do it like she dances, you know? Can this hot dancing girl fuck? You combine Ringo's energy with disco, he comes off like this Benny Hill style cheeky sex pervert. It's unwholesome and I don't like it. Also there was already a version of this song on the charts when this album dropped. Not an amazingly successful version, but it was there. Ringo does not improve on it. Like, what even was the concept behind this record? Like, what's the theme? What's the basic hook? I tried to find out what he said about it, but even with all the information about everything Beatles out there, I couldn't find much. He didn't seem to do much promotion for it, or, you know, not anything that's been preserved, at least. I did find one print ad. Let's read that. Ringo the Fourth is unmistakably Ringo. Not necessarily a compliment, but going on. Ringo the Fourth is Ringo's new album. It's warm and sparkling. It's friendly. And it's got a lot of punch. It's the kind of music that makes you feel good about everything. And that's Ringo. Unmistakably Ringo. Ringo the Fourth on Atlantic Records and Tapes. Okay, that's this is all, all very funny, because it, it makes Ringo sound like a brand of butter. <laughs> or like tomato sauce. 
a new drink at Starbucks. Notably, what it did not say was Ringo wrote most of the album. I guess they realized that that was not a selling point. Nor does it talk about Ringo getting up to date with the new sounds of the 70s. It's just banking on Ringo's innate likability. But that was kind of running out too. Being a likable guy who got lucky worked well for Ringo for a couple of years. But you can only be that guy for so long before people start resenting you. And eventually Ringo the plucky, fun-loving guy became Ringo the bored, talentless buffoon drunkening up and down the Riviera. Gets hard to like a guy like that after a while. People were just kind of sick of him. Okay, well, what about the Ringo originals, Todd? You haven't talked much about those. Okay, fine. Here's a country song Ringo wrote. Gypsies in flight. I look into your eyes and see Gypsies in flight. Look in your eyes and see? What? Okay, surprise, surprise. Ringo's not a good songwriter. I haven't talked much about the Ringo originals because they really do not leave any impression at all. And his co-writer Vinny Pontia, uh, he had some hits of his own in the 70s, so he wasn't nobody, but he also wasn't John, Paul, or George. Ringo's best work as a songwriter was with George. And that's not only because George is a better songwriter than Vinny, it's because he's a Beatles-y songwriter. And Ringo needs that connection to the Fab Four. If I can use a Star Wars analogy like I tend to do, I don't hate the prequels, but my affection for them is entirely dependent on its connection to the original trilogy. The further we get from that, the more I'm just not interested. And I think that's how people felt about Ringo the further we got from the 60s and into more modern production. This album is the Clone Wars movie of the Beatles. Let's close out with the final track, Simple Love Song. And right now, I still wonder how I keep asking myself, am I dreaming? You know what, honestly, this is the closest thing to a good song on the album, which makes me annoyed at the rest of it. See, Ringo can write a decent song, make 70s pop that fits him, find a style that's just Ringo enough. Why wasn't this the single? I think we went with Wings and Drowning in an attempt to look cooler, which... Why? Why would you do that? Tell the truth, I came in expecting a world-ending disaster, you know, Ringo does disco. But honestly, Ringo the Fourth just kind of flatly sucks. And that's how it was received. The reviews were brutal. And if you want to know how this did on the charts, well, okay, the third album underperformed by only reaching number 28. By comparison, Ringo the Fourth charted at 179. Ringo the Fourth got outcharted that year by an instrumental jazz fusion album dedicated to the book Dune. That happened. How Ringo felt about the album's failure, we'll never know. But from what I can tell, I'm gonna guess it was something like, whatever. <laughs> Harry, pour me another one. Ringo would remain a booze-up partying idiot until the late 80s when he did rehab, got sober, and started his all-star band, which has stayed his main gig for the last 30 years and earned back most of the goodwill he had squandered. He's also never stopped recording, including with some guys who got his vibe much better, I'd say, but it didn't really matter. Ringo IV killed his recording career dead forever, which makes him honestly kind of unique. Lots of people made really ill-advised disco albums in the late 70s. Most of those bombed too, and almost all of these people recovered. Ringo didn't. And I think that's because his shelf life was just up. It was powered by Beatlemania, and once that was done, so was he. But like I said, if he's ever been hurt by the lack of success, he's barely ever shown it. Very admirably, he has just decided to stay Ringo. Ringo brought his all-star band into town recently, I went, and he just seems happy. You know, he's happy being with his mates, playing the drums, and honestly, isn't that enough? Rock on, Ringo. Peace and love. And speaking of people who crisscross between pop culture icon and punching bag, you know this clown, right? Well, Lindsay Ellis has a new video up about the rise, fall, and redemption of one Guy Fieri, the Food Network host who survived being clowned on for years to become oddly wholesome. And you can watch that video exclusively on Nebula, a creator-specific platform where you can watch great videos from other creators like H Bomber Guy, Adam Neely, and myself. And now, if you sign up with my link, you get free access to Nebula Classes, where our creators host classes on how to be a creator. 
You will not only get access to all of the great stuff Nebula offers, plus classes, but you will get it for a little over $2.50 a month. And you'd also be directly supporting me, which, you know, I'd appreciate it. So click the link in the description and check it out below. Thank you for listening, and good night.